I got involved uh, in writing the scripts for the Big Finish audio reconstructions uh, because I've been working for the company for a long time uh, on their Doctor Who audio range and I was driving the line producer David Richardson to Kent because we were recording some stuff in a studio in Tunbridge Wells and he happened to mention that uh, the license for the Avengers uh, had been acquired and we were going to be doing adaptations of the Lost episodes. And I happened to mention that I'd watched an episode of the Kathy Gale Avengers the night before because I was researching something else. It was a, quite an entertaining thing to watch. So I was very much aware of the series and, and what was going on with it. And sort of without actually the question ever coming up or being asked, uh, by the end of the car journey, I was doing it. I don't remember there actually being a moment where we said, do you want to do it? And I said, yes, it just sort of happened organically uh, during the journey. And from that, I uh, then ended up uh, writing the vast majority of the Lost episodes. Right then, folks, easy does it, easy does it, fall inside then. The show, ladies and gentlemen, is about to begin. It's about to begin! I wrote, I think it works out as about 18 episodes, uh, 15 of which were adapted from existing scripts that uh, had been kept in the archives and three of which were adapted from episodes uh, where there wasn't really anything available. Um, and after that I've gone on to write sort of another uh, two or three um, episodes of Steed and Mrs. Peel adventures uh, based on comic strips. Uh, but from the Lost, the Lost episodes specifically, uh, I think it's 18. With a lot of the episodes where we had scripts, uh, we've had uh, full scripts, we've had camera scripts, and we've had rehearsal scripts. And in one case, I think, which I think was brought to book the second episode, we had both. Um, what I find interesting about a lot of those uh, is that it does reveal to you a lot of the information we don't have. I come from a Doctor Who fan background, and Doctor Who fans, in a weird way, have a lot more missing episodes than Avengers fans do. But in a weird way, we're quite lucky because every single one of them, there is a soundtrack that exists. A good chunk of them have photos. We can roughly tell what's going on at all points. This is not true of the Avengers. Even with the ones with scripts, we don't necessarily have all the information. The camera scripts, for example, uh, are slightly further down the line than the rehearsal scripts. The rehearsal scripts tell you all of the plot, all of the little details, but they're not final. With one of the episodes called One from the Mortuary, we have the rehearsal script and we have the photos, the telesnap photos done by John Curra, and they don't match. There are scenes in one that aren't present in the other, so we are aware that they developed between one and the other, but there is no way of telling what the new scene is, and so you have to make the decision about, well, do I try and replicate the new scene or do I try and adapt the more original one, which was eventually the route I took. The third episode has two bits in the script that I particularly found troublesome. One was the exciting pre-title sequence, which consisted of the phrase, car driving down country lane, etc. This was the opening sequence. This is the big, thrilling, exciting action opening. It's a car driving down a country lane. I have no idea what's supposed to happen, but I had to come up with something for that. And the end of it has Keel and Steed surrounded by thugs. They've all got guns. Steed and Keel aren't armed. They have no way of dealing with this situation. And then the stage direction is the following two words, as directed, and then they've won. The very next line, they have won, they've defeated all the villains in those two words, and I had to come up with a way of doing that on audio, which was fun in its way. Who's next on the ghost train? Step this way, ladies and gentlemen. Take your seat now for the cover of fear. Tunnel of Fear is one of the episodes where there was no script. Uh, there is an astonishingly wide range of information we have on different episodes in terms of some we've got a lot of information from one source, some we've got a lot of information from another, and they don't always overlap. Uh, so Tunnel of Fear, we had a lot of what are called telesnaps, uh, which during the 60s when there wasn't video recording, uh, a photographer called John Curra or Cura, I'm not actually sure how it's pronounced, would take photographs uh, of episodes of TV programmes that actors could then use to have a record of their work, or directors could, or whoever could have a visual record of their work. Uh, Tunnel of Fear, that's what we had. Um, we didn't have a script, 
We uh, had a few storylines from different sources. We had TV Times listings and stuff that had gone to other countries. Um, yeah, that was, I think, about the sort of the limit we'd got of detail and information about it, um, th which was a reasonable amount to work on because uh, we'd, we'd got a few episodes where we didn't even have the photos and we just had like two very, very short synopses to try and extrapolate uh, 50 minutes of drama from. So uh, with this, at least, we had lots of photos of where most of the scenes were, the people involved in the scenes, uh, but we didn't necessarily know what they were saying to each other or what was going on in them. The, the rest of the research, to be fair, a lot of it had already been kind of done for us by uh, Alan Hayes and Richard McGinley, who'd done a lot of research into that period, and they'd collated a lot of the different information uh, about about all of the stories. Um, and it was sort of just looking at what they'd got and looking at TV of the period as well, just to try, try and get a sense of it. There weren't any actors from the original series that were available when I was writing this specific one. I think it might even have been the first one I wrote after Patrick McNee had passed away. We didn't have a massive amount of contact with him because he was obviously very happily retired uh, in LA. Um, oddly enough, um, it was only when I actually saw the episode I realised there were um, people involved with it still alive that I might have been able to get in touch with, which was mainly Nicky Henson. Um, a relatively well-known actor nowadays who just turns up in the background as an extra, which incredibly distracted me all through the very first viewing of it. Uh, him and um, Julian Holloway, whose name I couldn't remember, and I kept trying to remember when I was watching it because it was, a, it, it was just very strange to see these two actually quite well-known actors with no dialogue just hanging around there in the background. Dr David Keel was and has always been quite a bit of an enigma uh, to the Avengers viewers because most of his episodes didn't exist. We slowly have started to gain extra little bits with the various episodes that have been recovered. It's proved quite useful, particularly with the episode uh, Go On and Repeat, where it's a solo Keel episode, so it's entirely about him. Uh, but that was one of the things that was great working on these episodes, particularly the initial set of 15 scripts just a sense to get a more detailed, a more rounded sense of who this character was. There are lots of little details that turn up in a few of the episodes that give you a lot more detail about him uh, and his particular relationship with Steed. Uh, particularly, uh, there's an episode called Toy Trap, where the episode ends with a massive blazing row between the two of them because Steed has effectively taken advantage of one of Keel's friends and he's not very happy about that. And that very much colours who he is as a person and there's an interesting and sort of contrasting relationship there, particularly because there's quite an even dynamic between the two of them that there isn't necessarily in the later series where he is clearly the superior uh, rank, if you like. Look, your uh, philanthropy is just a little unexpected, I must say. What's behind this? Well, as it happens, uh, I have business in South End, too. Uh, now, if you really want to help Black, wouldn't it be a good idea if you nip down there, ferret it around a bit? Well, you could start with his mum. Yes, it might be an idea. <laughs> but first of all, he's got to hand himself over to the police. I will be personally responsible for getting him to the nearest police station, right. OK? Now, look, if you want to get anything done tonight, why don't you start away, eh? Good night. Just a minute. Steed's sort of iconic nature uh, in some ways makes it easier to write the dialogue for him. Uh, but at the same time, he's a character who goes on quite a long journey. The series lasts, uh, I think it's nine years. And the character who turns up in the first series and the character who turns up in the later years are very, very different. And it did help that by the time I had to write original dialogue for him, I'd worked very closely on 15 scripts using the dialogue originally written for him in the 60s. Um, one thing that was very noticeable looking at those original scripts was I think even from like episode one or two uh, it was very clear he was the lead of the series even though they were nominally equal billing very very early on you were aware the writers are clearly having a lot of fun with Steed and enjoying themselves hugely um, that's not to say they're not having a nice time with with Keel but but everything Steed gets to say is brilliant and funny and clever and and he's just roguish and charming, and he's such a great character to work with. It's just an honour to be allowed to play in that sandpit. That was quite a bluff. You heard me believing it. Oh, haven't you heard about these things? Uh, we use them an awful lot during the war. I mean, you weren't bluffing? I must confess, I really frightened myself for a moment. I feel 
quite frightened now. They cost a fortune. Oh, hello. Oh, I want the police, please. Oh, no, thanks. Thinking of giving it up. I was very pleased with the finished script. It uh, was a very tricky thing to pull together. Um, there was huge amounts of the story, as I said, where we didn't really know what was going on. There were just massive sections where you would have a photo. The, the bit I mainly remember being there's a, there's a sequence with a fortune teller and it's not very clear what they're talking about. There is no information we have about what was going on in that scene and I kind of had to make it relevant somehow. When you actually see the original episode, uh, the fortune teller is effectively a red herring. It's a throwaway gag for a scene. And you kind of don't expect that to be happening when you're writing. You're trying to justify everything and you're slightly forgetting that some bits are likely to be slightly padded or filling in time while other things are happening over the other side of the set. It's very odd watching the original episode because it ever so slightly feels at points as if someone has taken my script, adapted it, and travelled back in time with it, and like made it in the past. Um, but only at times. There's a, there's a striking amount uh, where it veers away. And this is even from the same basic storyline, the same order of scenes, the same set of characters, doing roughly the same sort of things. Um, that There's an awful lot of variation and moments where it veers away. Um, I had a 50-50 choice, and almost every time there was a 50-50 choice of it could be this or it could be that, I picked the wrong one. Uh, so there is a sequence where they look in the, in the safe, and in the audio version it's too much money to just be the takings of a fun fair. In the original TV episode, it's the takings from a fun fair. Uh, the final sequence, which involves a cigarette bomb, in my version it's a bluff, in the original version it's actually a bomb and all of these little things where it could have gone way, could have gone the other. There are some bits where it gets really close. I think that I feel the Steed stuff is pretty close. Um, some of his sort of Barker speech is are almost like word for word what I put, and uh, that I feel I'm quite pleased about because he was the character that's obviously, as we've said earlier, so iconic and brilliant that uh, to kind of feel that I got even closer to doing what the original writers did on it uh, is very flattering and satisfying. Steve first came with a beautiful Moroccan slave girl performed the dance of the bronze chain. Each girl signified a link in the sheik's vast harem. All right then, Fatima, give them a sample of what they're about to see then. He uh, got away. Hmm? Look, over there. I particularly enjoyed uh, with the original episode uh, the sort of the general sense of fun of it. I think it's colourful, it's playful. Um, the episodes we had beforehand are ever so slightly veering towards the serious side. Probably the Frighteners maybe a bit less. Um, but Tunnel of Fear very much feels like the series it's on its way to becoming. It's clearly having a ball, particularly what they're doing with Steed. Steed hanging around uh, at a fun fair with a, a bunch of belly dancers is about as Avengers an image you could possibly want. It just made me very happy and um, it's, it's just a very entertaining, very funny uh, story with a lot of colour and a lot of style. And yeah, I think it's just genuinely a really engaging, well-performed, cleverly plotted episode. Um, I suspect it's the best one of the ones we've got, though time will tell. You kind of, you're used to the others and it's, seeing something new is always exciting. Um, and it's just also a lovely little window into the past because I would say I never thought we were ever going to get any more episodes back and so to be working so closely on something like that and then for it to come back um, is just a delight. It made me so happy.